for me, making my way to the kitchen and cooking for myself was an act of love and an act of, of trying to heal my grief because I was literally holding his knives, right. you know, at the stove where he had cooked. And so that was a way that I felt his presence close to me. Hello, I'm Nina Westbrook, and this is the Do Tell Relationship Podcast. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, a relationship expert, and a generally curious person fascinated by exploring the many ways we connect with one another. I'm here to guide you through the twists and turns of navigating your relationships with authenticity and compassion. Join me as we dive into candid conversations with health experts, celebrities, and overall interesting people exploring their philosophies on relationships, life, wellness, and making a lasting impact. So grab your favorite beverage, cozy up, and let's explore what truly matters in life. Welcome to the Dutel Relationship Podcast, where every episode is an invitation to deepen your connections and live your most authentic life. Let's get into it. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Dutel Relationship Podcast. I'm your host, Nina Westbrook. And today, I'm so excited because we get to chat with actress and New York Times bestselling author, Timby Locke. She, you may know Timby from her incredible writing skills. She wrote her memoir called From Scratch. And for those of you who are like me and don't get enough of an opportunity to read, you may have seen her series on Netflix, which was her, so her book, Her memoir was adapted into a series for Netflix with an incredible actress named Zoe Saldana playing Timby. Um, You may have heard of her. And when I tell you this series was the talk of the town when it came out, it was so amazing to be able to watch the different episodes and talk and chat with my friends and kind of follow up and share stories about how we cried and how we laughed and how taken we were by her love story. And so for any of you who have not seen it yet, please watch it. It's amazing. And um, the other reason I'm so excited for today's episode is because we get to talk about a sometimes cool and challenging topic, which is how to cope and handle dealing with the loss of a loved one. If I don't want to spoil it for you, but Tim B has written about written about grief using grief allies or having grief allies and how community impacts the grieving process and how important it is to have a community to get through those difficult times um i just really appreciate timby's take on grief and what that looks like for her and how she's been able to turn her grief into action and really figure out how to move forward and how to create the life that she wanted for herself, even having gone through the loss of a significant loved one. So much more to come with our guest for today, Tim B. Luck. But for now, we're going to take some questions from you guys. I have Megan here with me, and she's going to share the first question. Hi, Go ahead, Megan. Thank Hi. you. Yay. We got a lot of great questions. And actually, today's is a really good one. Um, today's is, is it ever okay to reach out to an ex while in a relationship? You know what? That's a really good question. Um, I think that, again, like so many things, it depends on the person. It depends on the relationship, the current and the previous relationship. Um, I think it takes a lot of maturity. It takes a lot of growth. I will say that as a rule of thumb, if the relationship has ended recently, well, if you're in a new relationship and your previous relationship ended recently, then there might be some kinks that still need to be worked out. It just also depends on how long were you in the relationship when you weren't really in the relationship, you know, before you 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 exited that previous relationship um, officially. But I think that sure you can. Many people are friends with their exes. Hello. Have you ever heard of co-parenting? Right. Um, I think the mature adult thing to do if the circumstances allow um, for a peaceful 
respectful exchange of information or environment or friendship, it's 100% okay to reach out to an ex um, or be in contact with an ex when you're in a new relationship. I think that it's also a conversation that's worth having with your current partner to, right. to gauge their um, their flexibility on that matter and also to see if there are some boundaries that you can put in place with your new partner if they do feel uncomfortable about you talking to your ex um, and just asking questions like what is it going to take for you to feel comfortable or what is it going to take for you to feel secure when it comes to me having conversations with my ex I think it, it just really depends on the level of maturity of all parties involved. Right. And how much you share together. Right. Because co-parenting is different than if I ended the relationship and we have nothing tying us together really anymore. I mean, what am I reaching out about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, people are friends with yeah, their exes, whether they have children or not. It is possible. Um, it just depends on it's like any other relationship. If you work at it and you build up to having a like I said, a peaceful positive, healthy exchange between two people. Any, any friendship can arise, right? It's just a matter of balancing and incorporating um, that old flame and that old relationship into your new life with new boundaries and new rules and new parameters uh, mm -hmm. that surrounding you and your new partner and prioritizing you and your new partner and that relationship. So... I love that. Short answer, yes, but it, it takes work just like any other relationship. I, I totally get that. Yep. Open communication and boundaries always. <laughs> okay. Let's go one more question. One more question. Okay. Our next question is, my partner and I disagree about something. What can we do to keep the conversation from turning into an argument? Hmm. If it's something that you've already determined that you disagree on and it's like kind of a hot topic or hot button for you and you both know that as a couple, I think that there are a couple things that you can do to help um, kind of navigate that difficult conversation. The first thing is maybe each taking the time out to write down your feelings and emotions surrounding the topic and what it means to you and why you feel the way that you feel. And I think that also having some things and being able to like reflect on things that when you're when you're talking about having to make a decision together, but two people are not in alignment, that can be really tricky. And we see that come up in parenting often. We see mm -hmm. that come up with disagreements about financials um, and how we're gonna be spending our money, where are we, what are we gonna be doing, where is this money gonna be going? Um, and we see that often, I think those are the, like maybe the two main things that people might disagree on where it's kind of, there's no third vote to kind of, um, to choose from or to to be the no third person to be the, de the deciding vote. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the person, instead of having the third person that's going to be the deciding vote, you put all of your, um, you put everything in the middle and leave every, put everything on the table. And this is what, when the real work comes in, you have to, really sit down and talk to your partner and decide and figure out what you can what you can let go of what can you not take off of the table and once you guys are able to narrow down all the things that you can take off the table versus what you can't take off the table for for each of you then you have to work on combining all the things that are left on the table and making the best decision that feels equally um, I mean, and maybe it's not equally, but maybe it's just someone is having to compromise slightly more than the next person. But I think if two people can make a compromise and meet somewhere in the middle, then you'll be able to both be both. Then you'll both be able to 
come out not feeling gypped or duped Mm -hmm. and feeling like you didn't get what you needed from the conversation or you did not get what you needed from the solution that you both came up with. I think that there has to be flexibility on both sides and you have to go into this negotiation of sorts knowing that you're not potentially, you're potentially not going to get everything you want or everything you need from the outcome of the situation. That's what being in a relationship is, right? Um, compromise. It's compromise. Yes. And I, I feel like one time we talked about this, that you said going into it with it, like, let's, the problem is the problem, right? Or this conflict is the problem. We are a team or like kind of having that mindset of like, mm-hmm. we're here to address the Externalizing. Problem. Right. Right. You're, you're, you're talking about externalizing the issue. And I think that If you as a couple are able to see any, you know, obstacles or circumstances or situations that may arise that are not positive and pleasant, and you're able to kind of externalize that from as as something separate than the relationship or from each of you, then you can both work together to then tackle that problem rather than finding faults in each other and trying to change or fix or change each other. There's a behavior that both parties are not comfortable with. There's something that's going on in the environment that both parties are not comfortable with. Then therefore, let's remove that from the picture and figure out how we can navigate that together rather than going against each other. Yeah, I love that. Great. Good. Those are really good questions. Um, If you want me to answer any of your questions, find the link in the description and I will get to it in a future episode. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Um, I feel like this is going to be really good. I think we're going to be talking and chatting about some really difficult topics that, well, difficult for some. As you know, a lot of people tend to shy away from talking about grief Mm. and sharing their stories. Not this chick. No. (laughs) And that's what I really, truly love and appreciate about you because... It's through our storytelling and through our vulnerability that we're able to connect. You said you like to connect with other people, mm-hmm. which yeah. I do, too. Yeah. So this is going to be really interesting, and I'm grateful you're here. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, it's when you describe it to me in that way, it made me for a second reflect on the fact that there was, you know, I am here mm-hmm. today with you to be able to chat and talk about these things because it's been hard won and I evolved into that person, mm-hmm. you know, through mm-hmm. life experiences that I'm sure we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be able to sort of put a spotlight through storytelling mm-hmm. on what does this universal experience called grief mm-hmm look like? What can it look like? Right. Um, And what you're saying is, I I think that you have such a unique perspective, Mm -hmm. which I truly can appreciate. But you're so right. This process of grief is so universal. And I think a lot of the times, unless you've kind of gone through it, it's a little bit more difficult to connect with. So hearing that's why hearing your story yeah. is so important for all of us. Yeah. And I will say right off the top, everyone's experience of grief is unique unto them and unique unto the relationship that they are grieving. Mm. Meaning you can, you know, um, grieve one loss differently than another loss. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we talk about that, I never like to like put like a universal, like it's a, it's a this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's some things that are universal, Mm -hmm. but everything is going to be unique to one's lived experience. And when I wrote my book from scratch, which I'm sure we'll talk about, Mm -hmm. that was really me writing my singular lens on one experience you know, of one relationship at mm-hmm. a particular moment in my life with the hope that it would shed a light on that, on a conversation that is long overdue. Well, across I, the, you know, uh, American society. I, I think you've been able to accomplish that, <laughs> okay, thank that you. goal. Um, before we get there, mm-hmm. I would love to, you're, you're the definition of a dynamic woman, an actor, a be- New York Times bestselling author. You have this, your podcast host, yes, which I listen to your podcast and Thank I you. think is truly amazing. And Thank I'm you. such a 
I'm going to just say I'm going to I'm a girl's girl. So I <laughs> love hearing all of this amazing stories from these really incredible women. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got here mm. and a little bit more about your origin story mm. and what has led you to this space today? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I grew up in Texas, Houston, H-Town. <laughs> Um, and I was always involved in the arts, mm -hmm. mostly because um, my parents were divorced. Mm -hmm. They were hardworking, trying to figure out how to, like, you know, raise my sister and myself. And they were like, stay after school as long until they shut the lights off mm -hmm. and, like, they close the gates. Understandable. And, yeah, right? And, mm -hmm. like, whatever they're doing, do that after school, which was usually plays or something like that. A lot of play, you know, a lot of imaginative play. Um, I had a grandmother that I spent summers with, mm -hmm. and she allowed us to play a lot. And so I lived early, early on, I was exposed to the arts. And early on, I was allowed to allow my imagination to take bloom, form, prioritize it, mm -hmm. even in my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So what that looked like is I had this dream of being an actor. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Like, how do you get inside of the television? That just <laughs> felt like the, like, how did those people do that? And I would see like the palm trees on TV and I'm like, I was like, what is this? So I sort of knew that that would be a part of my life. And of course, when I went off to college in Connecticut, um, I was like, well, this is what I'm going to do. But I also was at a great school and I wanted to study different things. So I studied art history is actually mm -hmm. my major. Long story short. That led me to study abroad in Italy. Oh, which is, I mean, like a dream. A dream. Yeah. A dream. And I was the first in my family to do anything even close to that. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was sort of, I, I didn't have a template in my family for people who had, you know, my parents grew up in like, you know, they grew up literally in rural Jim Crow <laughs> Texas. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. so no one was like getting their passport and going to Italy, mm -hmm. which, you know, so they were like, we support you graduate on time mm -hmm. and don't call us for money. Oh. <laughs> like, it was kind of like that. Those are the stipulations. <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay, I think I can do that. <laughs> um, anyway, I get to Italy and this is a part of what's in the book and in the series is I met a man, mm -hmm. literally bumped into him on the street. Mm -hmm. We fall deeply in love changes my life don't know this at the time right because i'm like 20 mm -hmm. and we begin a life together i mean i came back to the states he eventually moved here we marry we are from two different cultures he's italian he's a chef mm -hmm. from sicily um not so close with his family and by the time i got into the picture it got even more complicated the family stuff which mm -hmm. is very well documented in the in mm -hmm. the book as well as in the in the series that then leads us to our life in L.A. I'm an actor. He's a chef. And within two years of moving in L.A., thereabouts, he was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly my life changed. So I'm a professional actor, but now I'm his caregiver. He stopped working. And for the next 10 years, I was his primary caregiver at a time in my life where I was also you know, a working actor. And I also became a mom during mm -hmm. that period. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about on the emotional front was forged in those 10 years of being a caregiver and being a mom. Mm -hmm. And after his passing, and I say years after his passing, a couple of three years, actually, I began to think about writing a book about what had been our life, what had been my experience as a caregiver, what my experience of grief was, mm -hmm. um, and... I eventually wrote from scratch mm -hmm. and it was a page one rewrite of my life. And I didn't know it at the time. I was doing it just because I needed to do it, not because I had had professional aspirations of being, you know, a published author. Mm -hmm. I just felt like I had the story to tell mm -hmm. and um, I wanted help telling it. And I knew I needed um, the accountability of like an editor and like to really make I, I wanted to endeavor mm. to write book length memoir, not just an essay, because I felt like my story couldn't get contained in an essay. Mm -hmm. So I wrote it. It got the attention of Reese Witherspoon. It was a Reese's book club pick. It became a New York Times bestseller. Then talks of adapting it mm -hmm. came around. Netflix mm -hmm. signed on. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to be a part of this team. 
my sister, who's a screenwriter and is also a novelist, was the showrunner. Mm -hmm. And so together with Hello Sunshine and Netflix and Zoe Saldana, who plays the character based on me in the series, Mm -hmm. we make this series that is an adaptation of my book. And all of that, that arc from I was a little kid in East Texas after, I mean, in Texas after school to this has been um, more than I could have ever imagined. It probably felt like it was something that you totally wanted to do and weren't you weren't sure when all of that would happen. But do you feel like your journey into writing was also in any way, shape or form your journey through your grief? And how was that process emotionally for you writing that your story? Sure. Well, I had written all my life in terms of journaling. Like Mm -hmm. I'm someone who just like uses the page Mm -hmm. as a way to process what I'm feeling. Mm. Right. It's I need that like tactile, write it down. And I mean, I'm not on a computer. I literally pen to paper. The analog. Right. Mm-hmm. Analog. And I and, and so I've always done that my whole life. And so, of course, when my husband was ill, I was doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and after his passing and I also took writing classes while he was ill and while I was a young mom, mostly because I felt like, oh, I like this. It's a creative art form that I can do that's just for me, Mm -hmm. but it's helping me to process some of what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. Um, When I endeavored to begin to put all of that together in the form of a book, I knew that in order to understand grief, I had to process it. And I was asking myself a question, could love survive? Could I explain grief to someone who had never experienced it before in their lives, Mm -hmm. who had never been to Sicily, had never been married to a chef, was not a mother, could I bring them in and sit them down like a friend that I'm just trying to tell you what, from my corner of the world, from my little lens, this is what I saw. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that, I began to really understand my grief. Mm. And I really began to understand what it looked like in me when it had me laid flat, when it activated me to do things, Mm -hmm. when it um, made me more empathetic. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I learned through the process of writing. Through that process or through that documentation and through your journaling, were you surprised at what you saw and what you read looking back oh, yeah. when you were doing the research? Yeah. <laughs> every day, every day. Because I mean, look at uh as 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 you know, the kids look at <laughs> look at um, what had happened was. What had happened was um Yeah, I mean, so for the one thing when you're writing memoir, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to fiction, you know, I knew I needed to I wanted to be emotionally truthful to everything. And so I had to go back and look at like early journals from when I was like 21 years old, Mm -hmm. which I still have. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I remembered a situation one way, but when I went back to the source material, I actually had a different feeling then. Mostly because in the ensuing time, I had processed it so much that I was on the other side of it that I wasn't really always aware of that first primal feeling. I'll give you a very specific example. Mm -hmm. When I was writing the book, I was kind of glossing over a conflict Mm -hmm. with my um, late Mm father-in-law. I'm like, but it was okay. We were fine. You know, like it was rough, but we were fine. And it was, and I was like, something's not, and I was like, let me go back and find when I first met him. And like, what was all that like? And what was, what, how did I feel around the, when I got married and my in-laws didn't come to my wedding? Like, Mm -hmm. how did I feel? And sure enough, I had receipts. Mm-hmm. I wasn't feeling it. Mm-hmm. The, the 25-year-old me was like, ah, blah, 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 you know, mm-hmm. all of that, right? So I knew in writing that I had to go back and honor that person 
I had to go back and be truthful about those feelings mm. because I knew that the arc of the book was going to move me beyond that point. And that's the purpose of writing memoir is to show that we can go through certain experiences and evolve, change, move, expand, transform. Mm -hmm. That's why we read memoir, mm -hmm. why we sit around the campfire and listen to people's first person stories of shit they've been through mm -hmm. because we want to know how did you do it? How did you get through it? But the thing is, you got through it. And I think it's hard. I mean, people aren't typically that vulnerable. Mm. It is really hard, especially in today's mm. social climate, to just be your authentic self. It's a challenge. It mm -hmm. seems simple, right? Mm. But it is so hard to be vulnerable and to share your story and share all those, like, those feelings, the icky feelings and the, the ones that we don't want to remember, right? That we remember differently when we're, when we're, it's years beyond, be, behind us. What was that like for you and what did you take from that in terms of how you have evolved and how you were seeing things in the moment and feeling things in the moment, how your perspective has shifted today if you were looking back? Yeah, well, I would say my my trade and training and background as an actor means I live in the vulnerable. Mm. It's my job. Mm -hmm. If I'm not there, I'm not doing my job. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. the whole thing is as an actor is you are interpreting and sharing aspects of humanity, mm -hmm. all parts. And you can't sit in judgment of any part. Mm -hmm. So as the writer of the memoir about my life, I have to, you know, I have more information as the writer than mm -hmm. my 25 year old did at the time that I was actually having the experience. Right. And so I could have compassion for the ways in which, you know, I would just go pages and pages and pages of like, you know, this is horrible. This stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. It's going to get so much harder. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, that's nothing, mm -hmm. you know. But I was where I was. Mm -hmm. And that was very valid, right, at the time that it was valid. And so the the beauty of endeavoring to be in your truth to honor all parts of your life, the shadow and the light mm -hmm. is not for the faint of heart. Mm -mm. It's, it's sure is not that. easy. Um, if it was, more people would be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but I also know that I did not write the book for anyone else. I actually did not write it with the idea of public consumption. I think if you actually, if you talk to any person who's written a memoir, all you're trying to do is get the story on the page. You are truly not even thinking about a reader, mm -hmm, <laughs> which mm -hmm. sounds bananas, mm -hmm. but it's the truth. And then when they tell you, oh yeah, okay, ed copy edits are done, the book's gonna come out now, you panic because you're like, oh, oh, now I actually have to share it because you're just making it. Mm -hmm. I think that, just as a podcast host, I can relate to that aspect mm. in terms of having this conversation with you feels really good to me. Mm -hmm. But when it when the conversation then goes live and it's for everyone else to view, then yeah. that becomes a little more, you know, like, oh, everyone's going to see this. But in the moment, it feels really good. I think one of the things that you touch on often is this sense of community and mm -hmm. grief allies, right? Mm -hmm. And you talk about food being a grief ally, which I'll get into, okay. but talk to me about the importance and significance of community and people you can share your grief with and your story with and that in throughout the process and how that has been for you. Um, I thought after my husband passed that there was probably some part of me that thought like, because I never experienced that kind of loss before. I was like, okay, well, somehow you just get through this and you just do it. Mm -hmm. I guess by yourself. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized really quickly, like almost within 48 hours, I was in a whole new territory. And if I wasn't held up or supported or able to learn from others who'd been through this mm. that I personally me, Tembi, would f completely fall apart. Mm -hmm. And so for me, and, and I think, let me back up and say that the fact that I had been a caregiver for a decade, I had become very accustomed mm -hmm. to the supportive community. Mm 
Mm -hmm. because that is how you raise a child (laughs) and with an ill partner and go through chemotherapy and surgeries and all the things was I had a beautiful network of friends and family who showed up, Mm. who showed up. And so that's a blessing. Mm -hmm. And it was a gift. And I didn't quite know that I would need them because how would I have known as a newly grieving mom and and, and widow? But turns out it did. And it's a little bit different when... It's different. The community that you said that you had around you that was helping you to carry out your and fulfill your role as caretaker is helping you to be a caretaker and helping you with daily tasks. But the overall goal for everyone is to help care for For this person, Mm -hmm. right? Then when all of that, it's very different when you become the patient or you become the one who needs to be cared for. You're so used to taking care of someone else. And sometimes we all have a difficult time in accepting or knowing or understanding when we need to be taking care of ourselves. And also, I didn't know what I needed day to day. Mm -hmm. So every day felt fresh and new and like, what do I, what, who do I call on today? What do I need? And by the way, Mm. you know, I talk about this with like ease and and grace and think, but this is like, I was in the trenches for years, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, trying to sort of like, put the pieces together in my psyche and in my heart and in my life and understand like just literally how to put one foot in front of the other and show up for my child in my life, you know, as a sister, as a friend, as a professor, I I was wholly lost. Mm -hmm. And so, but what I found, so well, for one thing, I needed a group of women who had been through exactly what I'd been through. And I don't Mm -hmm. mean that they had to have lost a husband to cancer, but Mm -hmm. I needed to be around young widowed people, or at least find where the heck they were in the world. Mm -hmm. Because I knew I was not a unicorn. Like, I'm not the only person this has ever happened to. Right. So where are they? And I need to, like, understand, can they talk? Can I learn about this experience? Like, what are the pitfalls? What are the hard points? Why are birthdays so hard? Why is the ho- why are the holidays so hard? Wow. Why are little things that you don't think about, like just hearing a song or going to the grocery store and literally seeing the like, you know, his favorite bottle of olive oil? Why is that like reducing me to tears? Like, I didn't understand mm-hmm. the full depth and breadth of how it is just woven through so many quotidian aspects of life. Mm -hmm. And then what were some of the skills or tools or um, tips that had worked for others that maybe I could cobble together in my own way and could work for me? I literally went kind of hunting Mm -hmm. for people who had had a shared experience. I found a group. Soaring Spirits, I will speak of them always if anyone's listening. Soaring Spirits International is um, an online and in-person group that serves widowed people worldwide at mm-hmm. every age group, mm-hmm. right? Um, men and women. Um, and that was the first time I was in a room of people who were like, I was like, oh, they get this experience. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's what this is. And um that was life changing because I saw people who were five, 10, 15, 20 years ahead of me. I was like, how does someone do this for 20 years? Wow. This feels horrible, mm-hmm. you know? And when you see someone who is alive, vibrant, awake, open, empathetic, transformed, and they are still standing upright and they've lost their person, you go, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe. Maybe that's possible for me. Mm-hmm. The hope the that hope. you get, and that's from... what that organization gave me. And in some ways, when I sat down to write from scratch, I hoped that, you know, eventually when I knew there would be readers, I was like, well, I hope that that's something that people might take from my book. The way I learned from Cheryl Strait's book, Wild, which is really a grief book. I mean, people, I talk about it a lot because it was a seminal book for me around grief. It was the first time I read a book page to page where I was like, oh, yeah, she's hiking this trail and all the things, Mm -hmm. but she's grieving her mother. That's what this book is really about, is like making sense of her life on the other side of her mother's death. So I think that that I think that using or finding Grief allies, that was definitely one of your major grief allies, right? Yeah. This group. 
you talk about using food yeah. as a grief ally. That is true. So can you talk a little bit more about that and explain? I know that in the Black community and Black culture, which is that universal thing, food that I'm talking about that connects us sure. whenever someone's experienced a loss or is going through something. Yes. Maybe you set up a food chain yes, and absolutely. you're drop, you're bringing yes. casseroles and yes. different things of that nature. Can you, you're, it goes a little bit deeper than sure. that. So sure, can sure. you yeah. explain to me what you mean when you say grief ally and you food, food ally? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, there is that long cultural and ancestral tradition of like, I literally let me build you up and literally at the cellular level, give you nutritious, dense food to keep you alive and awake through this difficult mm. thing your body is doing, because also grief expresses itself physiologically. Mm -hmm. And so it has a great physical toll on people that cannot be underestimated. Mm -hmm. So literally bringing food to people is critical, mm -hmm. like critical, and mm -hmm. you don't want to eat. So that's also the sort of tug and pull when you're deeply grieving. Beyond the cultural piece, the fact that I had been married to a chef mm -hmm. made it so that I had a complicated relationship with the kitchen and with meals because so much of that had been centered in my life and in my marriage with my late husband. Right. So literally cooking beyond the the repast and people bringing food and, you know, I'm talking into six months in, one year in, a year and a half in when people aren't bringing food to you mm -hmm. on the daily or on the weekly. Like what relationship with food could I have that felt loving, generative, sustenance? You know, I had to feed my child mm -hmm. clearly every day, mm -hmm. but I also needed a way to be in community, in communion, I should say, mm. and in conversation and in connection with my late husband. And the food that I make, and I often would make things that I'd seen him make and I had to like relearn them for myself. Mm -hmm. Or I'd call my mother-in-law, his mom in Sicily, and we'd sit on the phone and I'd be like, walk me through this thing. Because I was craving those flavor palettes. I was craving um, the textures, the warmth, all of that aspect was, I was bereft of it. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, coming back to the table, coming to kitchen, coming, coming to the kitchen, coming to cooking was an expression of my grief and also my healing. When did you realize that food was going to be such a central part of your story moving mm. forward? And was that the moment that mm. your relationship with food changed? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I think seeing how my mother-in-law, so let me back up and say that I would spend these summers, the first three, well, actually really seven or eight summers after my husband passed away, I spent with my mother-in-law where I would take my daughter there and we would have this family connection. Mm -hmm. But those first three summers in particular, which are documented in the book uh, from scratch, we, she was really, her love language was food, mm -hmm. much like her sons had been, mm -hmm. but her love language with me was food. And I realized, and by the way, we, um, She's Sicilian's her first language. Obviously, English is my first language, but we share Italian in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so we would, you know, speak in Italian because she didn't speak any English. She would cook me these meals. And I was watching us build a relationship around the table. And I thought, this is powerful. And so I wanted to just keep all that close to me. So when I got back to the States, I would just like, no, that was my now home cooking, right? Mm -hmm. Even that plus grits, <laughs> because everything in my life is that plus grits. Okay. You know, um, is that a family of origin <laughs> meal that you I mean, it's just, you? it's like a, it's, yes. And okay. I, that is also in the series. But anyway, <laughs> grits. So I say all of this to say that I was sort of just stumbling my way through it. And then I realized, oh, food is also a beautiful way to talk about grief. And it's a beautiful way to bring people together. And it's a beautiful way to talk about community. And so I kind of stumbled into that as sort of a central metaphor mm -hmm. to organize conversations around caregiving, loss, um, you know, illness, community. Mm -hmm. And when I went to write the book, I didn't always know that there would be recipes in the book. But I, what I did was um, I was cooking while I was writing. Mm -hmm. So that's a part of my process also. Uh, writing process is I often cook, settle in, and then I would write. So it was very intuitive and interwoven. 
And I felt as though it was my duty as the writer of the story to let the reader feel that delicious meal that my late husband had cooked for me. So I wanted to write about every texture, every flavor, every color, all of it. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's also very sensual. I mean, that's why people, that's why there's a whole network, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, on Mm -hmm. food. Because people, it's just, it's ubiquitous. It's there. And yeah. I think that you speak so beautifully to your personal experience and your personal journey as it relates to food. And I feel like the reason why I can resonate with that and so many other people can resonate with that is because food is such a central part to Mm -hmm. so many different cultures. And that is something that we all share. Yeah, the way we invite it in, the way we, you know, listen, food, you know, everybody knows in families, you know, food is can be either, you know, it's like to eat it, eat it, eat, 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 or it's it can be with whole it, food can be a controlling thing. I can mm-hmm. control, you know, how I bring you to the table, what mm-hmm. you eat, finish your plate, don't finish your plate. And a, it, it can change and evolve over time. It does. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes this really interesting way to look at relationships. Right. Speaking of, so... Before we get into a quick little break, yeah. can you share what types of, we haven't talked about this, traditions oh. that you share with your daughter hmm. around cooking and food? And are there any special traditions that you guys share that you would yeah. like to share with us? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, our home imprint is certainly the Italian kitchen, simply because that's what she, you know, grew up when my late husband was cooking. So it's a lot of that. We um, we do cook together. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we also love to travel and explore new restaurants together, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, she loves sweets. And so she likes making. She's a baker. She has made, you know, gelato before, oh, you know, wow. like at home and things like that. Um, so it's definitely a part of like how we meet and discuss we meet in the kitchen a lot to discuss things Mm -hmm. to to sort of talk through her day my day and food is always there (laughs) it's just always there and we do do like very specifically christmas is the panettone which is like the italian christmas bread Mm -hmm. 100 percent for sure um yeah actually i would have it every day of the year but but. (laughs) that's really beautiful i love that We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I want to talk to you more about your future projects and upcoming things you have going on. If you're enjoying this episode, make sure to follow us on social media at Do Tell Podcast for more behind the scenes footage and clips. Visit us on BenetByNina.com for exclusive e-workshops, wellness guides, fitness and nutrition resources, and my Do Tell conversation card game, all created to encourage a lifetime of growth, inspiration, and personal development. If you want to hear more episodes like this one, subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast, where you will find all of my past episodes and interviews with other incredible guests. Okay, so... Before we get into upcoming projects, because uh-huh. I know there's something that you wanted to chat about upcoming, maybe, maybe. Sure. I, okay. I'd love to chat okay. about it. I mean, there's Lifted, which we've talked we've about. We've talked My about. Big, well, we haven't pod. really talked about it. Well, we so we talk will talk little, about okay, it. We'll talk about that. But um, you went from writing mm-hmm. and to having amazing actors like mm-hmm. Zoe Saldana mm-hmm, mm-hmm. bringing your story to life on screen. Mm-hmm. What was that process like for you going from doing the writing and, or bringing your bringing other people's stories to mm-hmm. life on screen mm-hmm. to having someone else bring your story to life? Wow. Were there any challenges in that? <clears throat> um, I mean, on, I can speak on a part. So there's like the personal experience and then the professional experience. Personally, I felt it was very freeing. Okay. Because I knew I had written my story. First of all, there's what I lived, Mm -hmm. right? So when you write a book or when you write a memoir, you are coming as close to the truth as you remember it and documenting that in your book, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And so my heart and soul are on the pages of that book. So by the time that I get to the screenwriting stage and then eventually into production where there's an actor in costumes that look like the clothes you wore back in whatever, you know, back in the day, I was like, oh, Tembi, that's an actor playing a version Mm -hmm. of 
you know, an essence of a parts of your life. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was never like that's me. Right. right. And, and also Zoe is um, amazing. And we really were, you know, she, from the very beginning, it was like, you make this character yours. I mean, the character, the character's name is Amy and not Tembi for a mm -hmm. reason, mm -hmm. because she's making the character her own. What I think came up for me emotionally was Eve was watching her beautiful performance of some of the hardest and most beautiful parts of my, you know, lived experience. Watching those at a distance, I thought I, had so much empathy for my young self, mm. for the parts of me that had to go through such hard things. Mm -hmm. So there were days on set when I would just like, I'm going to take a walk and just step away because I am understanding what I went through in a whole new way. Wow. So there was that that was happening. It was sort of meta, but it was also, you know, strangely freeing because I was given in a certain way a, the gift of being able to kind of w literally watch my life on screen. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And say, like, oh, well, gratitude mm -hmm. to spirit, to life, to to everything that I'm here. Wow. Right. So there was that. And then professionally, it was incredibly freeing because I was surrounded by the best producers Zoe's amazing. That the cast hurt. is amazing. Mm -hmm. The writing was amazing. You know, so I knew professionally we were in a brilliant lane. Okay. So I had none of those, you know, kind of like, oh, how is this going to turn out? Right. Wow. I, I felt like it would be, it would connect with the audience. I didn't know if it would, you know, you never know in, in my business in Hollywood, like if anything's going to be good or bad or successful or not. I, and I try not to think in those sort of um, finite, reductive or um, end result mm -hmm. sort of language. I was just like, we're making the best show we can make today. Did that mindset of I'm doing this for me mm -hmm. also translate to that portion no, of your life? No, because by the time you get to production, you're not doing it for you, you anymore. Do, okay, okay. I mean, I mean, what I mean by that is like, you, I was very aware that we were all coming together to like take the book, the essence of the book and lift it onto screen to give it a new life and that we were really in service to the story in ways that were beyond me. Okay. So meaning like, yes, I, my lived experience is at the center of it, but mm -hmm. these are universal experiences mm -hmm. that, that, that are, are bigger than me. The one thing I could do was write my story down, but what's happening now on screen, that is bigger than me. Well, I will say that my friend group and I truly, truly enjoyed mm. the series. We all cried about it. We all laughed. It was a very heartwarming experience to kind of go through the journey watching it on screen. I had no idea that my life would lead me to you mm. uh, all this time later. Yeah. Did you realize or know? Um, thank you how for that. Much... First of all, thank oh, you. Oh, sure. Thank of course. you. I mean, we definitely were like, I was like, I want to make the show that doesn't exist for black women who might be going through some stuff, mm -hmm. but also want love and joy. Mm. Well, congratulations. So I, I thank you when you tell me that, you know, that was a part of your experience. Oh, yeah, it totally was. And I think that, well, what was it like for you in terms of getting the things that you wanted portrayed <laughs> on screen were there any moments or any parts of the of your story that you were that like mattered. this has to absolutely. go absolutely okay can you sure. can you For share sure. what those I knew moments we, were my sister and I were very clear we were like you don't have a show if you don't have this 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 and this meaning okay. we don't have our show okay we don't have an adaptation of my book mm -hmm. you can have a show <laughs> mm -hmm. but it won't be you know, and so one of those is is a moment in the pilot. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it's two moments in the pilot. Uh, one is the first time Lino cooks for Amy in the restaurant, and she, you know, she's there with her friends, and he is like literally making love to her all with every our, dish that all comes. All of our out. dreams. Mm -hmm, that scenarios. so that really happened, mm -hmm. and I was like, that is the beginning of the seed of their relationship, mm -hmm. right? It's foundational to the beginning of the love story. Mm -hmm. And then second, was that when you fell in love? Um. I kind of say yes, okay. because I was like, and in real life, there was a lot more of a lead up to that moment. Okay. okay. So that by the time I arrived in that restaurant and he was cooking for me, I was like, 
what is happening? This is my person. I was like, he, this is my person. I can and I'm this. blushing and I have my clothes on. Like, what's actually <laughs> happening right now? <laughs> it was like one of those things where I was like, what is going on? <laughs> you know? And I, I, so that moment had to be in the series. Mm-hmm. The other thing that had to be in the series and in the pilot is the moment in the rain, because that actually did happen as well. Okay. My husband stood out in the rain for me when I fell asleep and he waited in the rain for me. And the reason why that mattered is, and I write about this in the book, at the end of his life, he also waited for me. Mm. And I don't, I'm not going to go into all of that now. Read the book. You'll mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. But those were, I needed that beginning and that end. You know, it's kind of like the prologue and the, the sort of like the epilogue. Um, and in the middle, we knew we needed, you know, um, uh, the moment when like the family comes, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, Amy's first time going back to Sicily. Mm-hmm. Um, there were just moments that in order to tell this story in the most truthful and authentic way we could, there were some non-negotiables. And I think you need that when you're telling, well, first of all, any creator and, and storyteller has to have those things that are like, they are pillars. Um, but certainly when it's based on um, a real story and real people. Mm-hmm. I, I really commend you. I think being in that situation, it could be challenging. And I know that I'm not in show business by any means, but I know that there could be a lot of pushback and things can be a little tricky. So having those boundaries and just knowing what you want and going for it yeah. is is really important. Yeah. And it's something that it's a lot easier said than done. It is, it is. But you know what? We were doing it in great community with, I mean, we had great producers. Mm-hmm. You know, my sister's a showrunner and Zynga Stewart's a director. Mm-hmm. So we kind of were really in alignment a lot, if not most of the time. Mm-hmm. And by the way, when there was like pushback or push and pull, it's usually in service of making it better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Like I know this is a non-negotiable, but all this stuff around it can change. Yep. Like you like that, you like that, you like this, great. But this thing, the core, the heart of it stays the same. And from that place, you can sort of really create something beautiful and dynamic. So the show that everyone gets to see and enjoy is an amalgam. It's a tapestry Mm -hmm. of all of these different artists and points of view with a core mission at the center. Which is beautiful. I feel like anytime we're a big sports family. So oh, okay. yeah. it's like having one goal in yeah. mind one and working goal. as a team and sharing input. I'm just such a huge advocate of collaborative work. Oh, and yeah. that's how you get a beautiful product. Magical and things. A be- yeah. Magical it's things at the end of It's amazing what people can do. And that's the thing about film, filmmaking, making television that I still am in awe of. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I thought like the first day I was ever on set as an actor, I was like, oh my gosh, we know what is this? Now, you know, at the, you know, 20 plus, almost 30 years in the business and now being on this side of the camera and, and helping to create the television. Mm-hmm. Um it's amazing what human imaginations can do when they come together. Oh, I feel I'm going to ask this question, but I know we have to move on. Uh-huh. Which do you like better? Oh, my gosh. That is I like know. asking me to like pick friends or like <laughs> what the things. Um, if, well, if you had to choose, <laughs> I mean, you know, I when I like when I'm acting, I miss producing and when I'm producing, I miss acting. Okay. So I feel like for me, but I do feel like there is a part of me. Um, in terms of producing and making television is one, I like getting to make stories that I feel will be impactful. Mm -hmm. And also I like, um, the, how we do it to do it lovingly and kindly Mm -hmm. and in true spirit of collaboration to lift up people along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, that community aspect and to change lives. And what I mean, and I don't mean that in a big lofty way. I mean, very specifically, I remember many times being on set with a spouse who was going through chemotherapy. I needed my health insurance. And I remember being on set many times being like, I hope we work until 8 PM because I'll get overtime and then I'll make my health insurance. Mm -hmm. That is a real thing in my business, Mm -hmm. right? In America. So to now be in a stage of my life where I get to create shows and have people know that, oh, maybe this job is going to sustain their family right? for the next year of having health insurance. That is like, I don't take that lightly. That's right. a beautiful thing. It's a, you know, and I, and I, I feel very blessed 
That's beautiful. Um, you're working with your sister. Mm hmm. On something yes, I am. new. Yes, we would are. Would you care to share? I would love to. So we are um, we are um, working with Universal Television um, to adapt her book series. Mm -hmm. So she's written a beautiful book series. We call it the Bluebird series, but it's Bluebird, Bluebird, Heaven, My Home, and then her newest book is about to come out. Um, so we're going to be adapting her books next. Um, and then also we are working on a show um, that's an adaptation of Jasmine Guillory's book, Drunk on Love, oh. which is a romantic comedy and it's set in Napa and about, you know, this family of winemakers. Sign I know, me up. I know, I know. That sounds amazing. So we're, we're busy. That's we're very busy. exciting. Yeah. Congratulations Thank you so on much. all of your success. Yeah, it's fun. Um, what is it like working with your sister? Fantastic. Getting that? Yeah. It's fantastic. And we, you know, talk about evolution of relationships. Clearly, I mean, we were like the kids who played in the sandbox together. And now mm -hmm. we kind of are still playing in the sandbox together, mm. but just at a different level. But we really... Um, we we really respect and, and 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 treasure our relationship and we take it you know seriously and what i mean by that is like we check in with each other we give it the same attention we would any real deep partnership mm -hmm. even like a marriage mm -hmm. you know and so do you separate the business from the sisterhood yes we do sometimes how do you do that we'll because say, there are a lot of people who work with family yeah. so this is good for them yeah, to yeah, know yeah. no i we definitely have so when we're in production we build in weekly sister check-ins where it's mm -hmm. like no shop talk is just what you doing how you doing how you feeling oh that hurt you that hurt me what public with all the things right <laughs> yeah. get it all out there there, right. Yeah. And we're in contract to do that work. Mm -hmm. Right. And it helps to clear the air to be so then you can show up and do the work. Mm. And then we can, you know, we can check in with each other along with a look, a wink or whatever it is. Right. And then when we're not in production, it's a little more informal, but we're still in that cadence of checking in with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, we basically are always in contract to kind of I know what matters to her. She knows what matters to me. Mm -hmm. And so having someone hold that with you is really important. And I can tell instantly, like, uh, that's not going to fly with her. Mm -hmm. And so let's let me figure out, like, if it if it if it's serving her mission to do that, then I have to have a conversation with her about why that might work. Right. And why she might have to, like, do it differently. Same thing she has to do with me. I mean, we were making from shot from scratch. She was definitely like, Tembi, I know you're saying this, but trust me, we need this here. And I'd be like, I'm going to trust you. So that implicit trust mm. and the safety, the vulnerability, it's all the things that go into relationships. That's what I was going to say. I think, first of all, you're, the dynamic that you just spoke of reminds me of watching my girls mm. and their sisterhood. I didn't yeah. have a sister growing up. I had three brothers, which yeah. I'm very, you know, I had very yeah. amazing relationships with each yeah. of my brothers. Yeah. But watching my girls and that check-in and that knowing and understanding, like, what's good for this one is not good for that one. And they understand that about each other and they're able to look out for each other and take care of each other in different ways, right? That's a lot it sounds a lot like that's what you guys were able to are able to provide yeah. for each other yeah. but the other important part you talked about is checking in and and that works in any kind of relationship it, whether you're working with a, a family member a friend or whatever the circumstances is are checking in is a really great Bye. way yes let's communicate communicate and and you know, know that at the end of the day, we love each other so much. Mm -hmm. Everything else could fall away mm -hmm. and that will remain. Mm -hmm. That That's giving it. each other the benefit of the doubt, it changes so much in any relationship. When you give someone the benefit of the doubt and you can trust in them and know that they have your best interests at heart, you you see things differently. Sure. Even when they upset you or bother. Yes. Give grace. Yes. I really appreciate that. I would like to first talk about your podcast a little bit. Can you yes. just share with us, yes. with all of the listeners, where they can find you Absolutely. and what, a little bit more about your podcast? Sure. So Lifted Podcast, it's anywhere you get your podcasts, mm -hmm. Spotify, Apple, all the places, and also on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and I sit down and do um, seasonal conversations with women, usually mm -hmm. eight conversations around a particular theme. And I really am interested in like the long form conversation asking, you know, sort of who lifts you 
who has inspired you? What's a pivotal moment when you've had to shift or change? Mm -hmm. And this season, I talk to women in the food space, people who are operating at their highest in the culinary arts. So uh, food editors, cookbook authors, chefs, um, entrepreneurs, winemakers. Mm -hmm. And I really just want to be inspired by other women mm -hmm. and understand sort of like how they not just have gotten where they're got where they are now but like what lifts them in the process right right and so it's just um transformational it for is. me listening being a part of the conversations has just, i learn so much and i'm a deep learn i love learning mm -hmm. and i love learning from other people i love just sitting around talking <laughs> You know? I will say you have a knack for getting in there and doing a, a real deep dive on these I, I different do. I don't, particular I don't topics. Like, that's one of the things. No, I know. you I'm don't. Like, oh I was God, not afraid is... to ask you any questions <laughs> after listening to your podcast because you really get in there. Well, um, yeah. which is and, and it's great because we can really learn so much from listening. And I think my favorite episode was about burnout. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. It, it was it was very That's deep. With Yasmin Khan, it was like yeah, it was like what 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 is that about? And yeah. I, you know, and look, I'm I'm figuring it out in my own life, mm -hmm. right? It's and so there it you you talked about community earlier. Mm -hmm. To some degree, these conversations are part of me you know, kind of selfishly trying to curate a community mm -hmm. of like understanding mm -hmm. and around shared experiences mm -hmm. and like, and, and there's and, some self-interest in there, yeah, but well, it's, it, we're sharing it. It's, it's, this is, yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's good information. I, I, you know, if I, and I listen to podcasts for that exact reason. Same. I want to learn and I want to know. And, and, um, and I feel very honored that these women, one, take the time mm -hmm. to sit down with me and then to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. but also, also just get in there and talk about the work mm -hmm. and like why their work matters. Mm -hmm. Because I'm also, you know, so there's like well known people and then there's people you nobody knows because I'm all about elevating everybody mm -hmm. right and i think there's there's you know people gave me a chance reese witherspoon gave me a chance mm -hmm. so we can't always just go to the people that you know everybody knows you have right. to kind of like really there's so much incredible work being done right in this world right now and gosh you know we just we just don't have enough time to talk to everybody well, luckily, through your podcast, we will continue to tune in and <laughs> hear you. all the d different stories. Thank so thank you, you for that. Thank you. Um, I would like to end today's episode as we end every episode with asking a question mm -hmm. from my do tell card game, mm. conversation card game. OK. And that question is. I hope I do well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're going to miss here. Okay, it's going to okay, be let's great. See, let's see. What does living a happy life mean oh. to you? Oh, it means living an authentic life. Mm -hmm. Happy comes and goes, mm -hmm. but there's joy in being authentic. Mm. And I'm always seeking the joy of authenticity, whatever that looks like. And even if that's being authentic through tears or hard stuff, there is a joy at the end of the day, putting your head on the pillow and knowing, well, I gave it my best and I was me. I'm just one of milli billions on the planet, however many people are on the planet now, you know, and I can only at the end of the day be as direct and as honest and as authentic as I humanly can. That's really all I'm here for. That's really amazing. That's kind of it. You know, there's not a bigger secret to it than that. I you love know, that it, all for authenticity and yeah, and it's you know it's 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 I, it's a, usually a gut check for me. Mm -hmm. mm. It's usually a gut check, a little self reflection, and it kind of like mm -hmm. guides you and and yeah, and, yeah, and often it's just like I know when I'm like something feels off and mm -hmm. I perhaps can't articulate it or not quite sure, and I'm just like, well, maybe less of that and more of this will help me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's never. I guess maybe at times it's like super clear, like a voice that drops in. But more often than not, it's kind of stumbling through like, well, that mm, I don't know. Oh, oh, over here. Mm. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, that. OK. Oh, that. Mm -hmm. So I'm very intuitive in that way. 
which is sometimes hard to articulate. <laughs> no, it, you just articulated it beautifully. Mm-hmm. And I, I totally understand. And I, now I feel like I'm going to ask you one more question. Okay. I, if you have time. Okay, let's see. I think I can. Um, what is the best advice you've ever received? There's a, this is literally what just popped into my mind. Okay. Okay. There's a quote by Rumi. Mm-hmm. that a, my acting teacher, Julia Ariola, told me years ago. And it essentially goes like this. Beyond ideas of right doing and wrongdoing, there is a field. Mm. I will meet you there. Wow. That was one of the most freeing things I have ever... Like, there is not a right way and a wrong way. Often, there's something bigger than these sort of finite shoulds, must, have tos, Mm -hmm. and it just is. Mm -hmm. And what if we played in that field? Wow. And so I try to think of that as a guiding force in my life and not be um, internally judgmental Mm -hmm. or externally judgmental. I was going to say that must be a very peaceful space to live in. Oh, I want to get there. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I forget the field is there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then as long as you find it, as long as you find your way back there. Oh, for sure. (laughs) I'm like, oh, wait, there's no right doing. There's no wrong doing. Let me go to that field. (laughs) But it is. So you ask the best advice. I would say that has kind of um, it imprinted me when I Mm -hmm. heard that the first time. It just kind of like stuck on me. Like, that's a truth. Mm. So now that I know it, I can't forget it. Amazing. That's what I got. Thank you so much. This was great. This was fantastic. I am so happy we got to do this. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am. Thanks for coming.